Welcome to our Positive Link Speaker Series session, Achieve the Extraordinary, Unlock the True Power of Purpose, presented by the Center for Positive Organizations at the University of Michigan, Stephen M. Ross School of Business. I'm Michelle Hunt-Bruner, Managing Director. Before I turn our event over to our host, Bob Quinn, I have a few notes to share regarding technology and sponsors. During our event, attendees are view-only participants and cannot be seen or heard. We have turned off the raise hand and chat feature, so please use the Q&A feature to submit your questions for our speaker, as well as to upvote those that you would like to have answered at the end of the session, time permitting. You'll see that we have enabled live transcription services for our event. This fe pe feature can be turned on or off using the Zoom settings at the bottom of your screen. Lastly, we are recording this event and will post the video on the CPO website as soon as we are able. The Center for Positive Organizations thanks the Sanger Leadership Center, the Tauber Institute for Global Operations, the Samuel Zell and Robert H. Lurie Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies, and Diane and Paul Jones for their sponsorship of the 2022-23 Positive Link Speaker Series. We also thank our series promotional partners, Ann Arbor Spark, and the Managerial and Organizational Cognition Division of the Academy of Management. Now, I would like to turn our event over to our host, Dr. Robert Quinn, one of the co-founders of the Center for Positive Organizations and a professor emeritus of management and organizations at the University of Michigan. Bob and Ranjay, please join me on screen. And Bob, will you please kick off our session with an introduction of Dr. Ranjay Gulati. Ron, uh, Ranjay, uh, it's an absolute delight to have you with us. Uh, for our audience, Ranjay is a professor at the Harvard Business School. He's held a number of significant positions. He's uh, published many papers, many books, including his latest book, Deep Purpose, the Heart and Soul of High Performance Companies. Um, we could spend five minutes on all of his professional credentials, but uh, I think we should do a different kind of introduction. I've asked Ranjay a very hard question, and that is, please tell us a story that tells us who you really are and why you're passionate about purpose. And I think uh, in listening to that answer, we'll find out uh, who we're really dealing with today and um, have someone we can really relate to. Ranjay, what's your answer to that hard question? Thank you, Bob. Uh, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here with you today to share some of my thinking. Um, you know, if you told me five years ago, I'm going to write a book about purpose, I would have said you're crazy. You know, to me, this was a topic not, not near to what I was doing. You know, I was a strategy and strategy implementation person. I studied how do you formulate and implement strategies to win in down and up markets. I studied unlocking growth in business. And, and he, yet here I am. Uh, and it was really a conference of a series of things that happened all at once. Uh, it all started with a very innocent email. Uh, I got an email from a former student of mine, you know, from maybe a decade ago. I don't remember his name. I didn't remember him even at all. I don't know where I taught him even. He just said, I'm a former student and I'm coming into town and I'd love to have a meeting with you. So I forwarded it to my assistant. I said, go ahead, set it up. And my assistant being very diligent as he uh, was, uh, had all my meetings are 30 minutes long. And he proposed a 30 minute window to this person and said, pick a 30 minute window and uh, we'll see you here on campus. So apparently he wrote back and had some back and forth with my assistant who came back to me and said, look, he's asking for more time. So I said, like, how much more time? He's, <laughs> he's saying he wants to come and have lunch with you. And ideally like a 90 minute lunch or something like that. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm so busy. I don't have time. You know, I'm like, oh, so many things to do. And, and then my, so I, don't, I said, Is, are you sure that's the only thing? And he's like, you know, he also said he's flying in just to see you. So I'm like, okay, now I'm feeling guilty. And I said, fine, go ahead, 90 minutes. Let's do it. Lunchtime. Uh, so, you know, I thought he's coming to ask me for some help. You know, sometimes my former students call me to help about raising money for their business or changing jobs or career transition or something like that. So, you know, we sit down. I don't, I, I kind of don't remember him really. Um, his face looks sort of familiar. And then I said, uh, so how can I help you? 
I'm like, how can I help you? And he says, oh, oh, oh I don't need any help. You know, um, I, I just wanted to have lunch with you. And um, he said, you know, I just want to tell you that, you know, I took your class 10 years ago. It had a huge impact in my life. It forced me to rethink what I do. And, and, uh, and I promised myself that one day I would come and have lunch with you and thank you in person. I didn't want to send you an email. I wanted to come in person. And, you know, I had always thought of my own purpose as really as a researcher. My, you know, my grounding was education was something I did on the side. It was kind of like a thing I did. And I can only had to force myself to say, what is my purpose? I am a researcher and educator. I had no idea how much of what we do in the classroom really does impact people. And, and it really did a, a, a reset for me in saying, I'm still doing research. It's not like I stopped doing research. It was like, I'm still doing research. But I, I, I view what I do in the classroom as much more significant uh, than I ever did before. And, it, and I was going on a sabbatical around that time. I had, um, you know, uh, I was teaching our AMP program, which is our senior leader program. And I had all these students who would be in their 50s and, and they would be thinking about their purpose. And a couple of them started asking me in one of my iterations where, Ranjay, we all have a question. What's your purpose? And I'm like, guys, give me a break. You know, I'm, uh, and, and so, but no, this discussion got serious. And it was just around the time Boston bombing had happened. And, and so there was a larger question about the role of business should play in society, in equity, what's going on in the world around us. So, you know, I came to realize that purpose was not just CSR. It wasn't just some side thing that businesses did. It was very central to who we are individually and who we are collectively as organizations. So that was my journey into the topic. When, uh, when you started wrestling with your own personal purpose and you started to clarify, did it make a difference in your life? Hugely, you know, purpose is kind of clarifying your intention, right? It's the why question. It's not a legacy question. It's not a what question. It's not a how question. It's really a, a why question. And, and you know, I, 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 as an academic, I had to go into the theory of purpose. And I was really touched by a definition that a Stanford psychologist, William Damon, came uh, provided about purpose. He said, purpose is something that is a stable and enduring intention to do something that is at the same time meaningful to the self, meaningful to the self, and consequential for the world beyond the self. We all of us want to have an impact, lasting impact that goes beyond the self. So we're trying to find this intersection between what's meaning gives me meaning and what might be of consequence to the world. And I think I, think I became much more proactive. I became much more deliberate. I would not have written this book, Bob, if I uh, wasn't thinking, because not only because it is about purpose, but in my own mind, you know, my purpose was about kind of preserving and enhancing my legitimacy with my group of scholarly friends, right? Which I still like to believe I would like to keep doing, but I also felt that, you know, maybe we have to think about ourselves as scholars who are engaged in the world of practice. How can we help inform and shape the thinking of our colleagues and of others as well? Is there room for us to do both? I love that answer. Um, I think in almost every case like that, when we see a shift from ego goals, impressing our peers, to making a difference, uh, to contribution goals, making a difference. And that's a powerful personal story. Now, you wrote a book about organizations and organizations having purpose. So I guess the first question is, you know, there's mission, there's values, there's all kinds of concepts. How is purpose different from these other things that we talk about? So, you know, um, let me offer you my version. This is, there's so much, you know, we always have this kind of taxonomy confusion that we have around us in our, in our world. I want to tell you how I came to the topic of organizational purpose, and maybe that'll help clarify this. Is I was at the time doing a study on small company growth. I was looking at the scaling problem in small organizations. And, and one of the questions I was asking small firm leaders was, so what are the challenges of scaling? And I wrote an article called 
building startups at last, which was about all oh, these startups, they need to put structure systems and processes in place. And if they don't do that, they're going to have chaos and die. And that's what entrepreneurs do. And after I published that article, I had a bunch of entrepreneurs tell me, you missed it, Ranjay. You missed something. And I said, what did I miss? They said, you don't understand. The moment we start putting these structures and things in place, you lose something. I said, lose what? The soul of the company. Now, I'm Indian by birth, and I can relate to soul and all that. But I'm like, what do you mean by soul? So I then spent a year interviewing 65 CEOs of fast growth startups to unpack the soul. And I discovered it was three things. The first was that depth of customer connection that you start to lose when you get big and you get bureaucratic. The second was the employee experience, that energized employee experience that starts to dissipate as people don't feel they have that autonomy anymore. And the third was purpose. This intentionality to, we are here to make a difference, change the world, have an impact, whatever it was. And it was that loss of purpose that really kind of deflated and took the energy out of the enterprise, what they call losing the soul. And, uh, but let me come to the taxonomy issue over here. You know, we always say, what is it? At the very, you know, this goes back to the work of Kenneth Andrews, you know, who he coined the term strategy for business. There is always the, the, the tactics, the strategy, and the vision. These are the what we do right? I have a vision 2025 or a vision 2030, right? Now everyone's got a vision. Somehow we have these five-year windows of visions. So I have a vision 2030, then I have a strategy on how we're going to get there. And then I have tactics around monthly, quarterly, whatever tactics to achieve that goal. That's the what we do. Sitting on top of that is the organization, the structure, the culture, the people, the processes. That is the how I do it. Now, a lot of us think it's enough. I know what I'm doing. I know how to do it. This why question was an academic question that sat on top of it, which was the purpose. Now, you might say, I don't need that. I know what I'm doing. I know how to do it. So what's the point of this why question on top? Now, people have used two words to describe the why question. Some has described it as mission, and some have called it purpose. And if you look over time, these two words have kind of come and gone in interchangeable ways. Some even try to parse and say, well, mission is this and purpose is that. I, I don't want to go into splitting hairs over here with you, but they both were trying to come at the why question. What would started to happen was frequently the why question would turn into the what question. Our mission is to provide best quality transportation services to people in Boston. So the why would just get blurred into the what question. And, and people would say, you know, who needs the why I exist question. But I think actually, if you think about it, the why question is hugely important. And part of my journey was into understanding the why of why, right? And I had to, for myself, understand for an organization, I understand for individual, it creates intentionality, it creates clarity, it creates even is good for health outcomes. So that makes us more resilient. And there's a whole range of psychobiological benefits of having a personal purpose. But the question was, how does it help an organization to have some abstract one-liner purpose statement? I mean, who cares? And they're very generic. I mean, even if you look at the, the wording, you know, EY, business for a better, a better working world. And you're like, come on, do I really need that? And how is it going to change my business? And it was really wallpaper. So that was kind of the starting point. I think mission and purpose get used interchangeably and we can split hairs on that one. But I think it's, there's mission, purpose, there's vision, there's the organ, the what and the how and sitting on top of that is the why. Well, you've, you've uh, made some really important points. An individual clarifies their purpose. And they change, as you've already illustrated. And then you said there's a whole list of scientific findings about the ways that your life changes. And that list blows people away because it's just astounding how many benefits there are. Now we shift to the organization. And you're saying it's the why, answering the why question. Well, lots of companies have websites. And on those websites, they say, here's our purpose. 
And um, I think you're telling us in, in the book that uh, a purpose is not a purpose is not a purpose. That is, uh, you use the word convenient purpose, and you talk about uh, the fact that uh, I'll put my words into this to say what I think you were saying, and that is, you know, you tell a CEO he has to have a purpose. If he's locked in to the mindset you were just describing, he comes up with some words, but I think you would be very disapproving of those words. Help us understand this notion of what a real purpose is and what it's not. So, you know, the Financial Times had a cover uh, article a few years ago called The Baffling Search for Purpose in a Purpose Statement. And, and then Chris Bart wrote an article in 1997 called Sex, Lies, and Mission Statements. I mean, if you read the, the, the mission statement of Theranos, it was to facilitate the early detection and prevention of disease and empower people everywhere to live their best possible lives. Purdue Pharmaceutical, the single largest contributor to the opioid epidemic's purpose was compassion for patients and excellence in science inspire our pursuit of new medicines. I mean, Facebook, when they got in trouble in Congress, paraded a purpose to give people the power to build community and bring the world closer together. Uh, I mean, Enron had one too. So I find it kind of, uh, you know, this purpose washing has really given purpose a bad rap. And then you have the other part of it is, that is the extreme version, what I call purpose as disguise. It, it, it reached a point where, Bob, when I had to write a whole chapter on the different variations of purpose, um, my publisher friends had told me that I needed a one word title for the book. And so the working title was just purpose. And then as I got into the research, I couldn't call it purpose because there were so many variations on purpose. So I landed with deep purpose, not because I wanted to, it was just, I was trying to distinguish what I called the purpose as disguise, superficial purpose, purpose as win-win. There were so many variations on this. And to the point where purpose was just an artifact. And I came to realize that purpose is not just a purpose statement. And, and it came to me actually from my interview with Satya Nadella. And, and, you know, as part of Satya's revitalization of Microsoft, which is an amazing story in and of itself, they changed their purpose statement. And, you know, Bill Gates had one to put a computer on every desk uh, in every home. Uh, Balmer had a long winded one. And Satya brought it back down to, to empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more. I wasn't honestly impressed by that. And I was like, and Satya told me, oh, purpose was key to unlocking our tra turnaround transformation plan. Our strategy implementation all hinged on our purpose. And I, with due respect, said like, look, I, I don't know. I'm not so inspired by this one line. It's pretty generic. And then he clarified. He said, purpose is not a purpose statement. It's the nine months we spent debating the construct of why Microsoft exists. And so I came to realize that, you know, purpose is about what value do we want to create? What is the problem we're trying to solve in this world? How are we going to solve it? How are we creating value? And for whom are we creating value? And I think all these questions get kind of, now purpose doesn't answer those questions, but it gives you some kind of guiding framework for that. And I think that was the piece I discovered. In some organizations, I found they wouldn't end with the one-liner. They would then embed below it a set of guiding principles that emanated from that one-liner. Saying, look, that one-liner is just an ambition. And, uh, you know, Drew Carton at Wharton has this really interesting paper in ASQ where he said there's a little bit of a paradox. These mission statements, at one level, they need to be inspirational and expansive, but then they also need to be specific. So there's an inherent tension there. You make it too vague to be inspirational, but then you need it to be specific. And so you're trying to figure out how to connect general aspirational to specific. And I came to realize that purpose is much more than a purpose statement. Um, you take a CEO or a senior executive, he or she is very educated. They've had lots of experience, and yet your explanation just now of what a purpose statement is seems to be inaccessible 
to many senior executives. Why is that? Why, why can't they come up with a real purpose rather than a convenient purpose? I think, you know, what happens is we all are very task oriented now, right? And, and the urgent the urgent crowds out the important, you know, we are very task oriented, we get myopic, um, you know, and I think is we, we, and, and, and so we are, this existential thing becomes an artifact that is kind of just sitting out there in the, in the haze. And, 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 and we don't see its value either. So part of it is part of what I had to discover was, okay, for those who are these purpose proponents, I'm like, how is it good for business? Let's be very clear because, you know, people want to be a, build a successful business. First of all, this is not, I'm not running a charity or a nonprofit here. How is purpose good for business? And part of, for me was to uncover those pathways because the ones who get it realize that purpose is not a tax on business. It's not CSR. It's not some social agenda. You know, it's not woke Inc as that book or describes purpose as it's much more than that. And it, it's very, it's, it's a powerful way to energize your business. And, and so for business leaders, they need to be able to see the intersection between this very existential statement and the day-to-day -day ground reality of what we are doing. Um, you talk, I mean, I mean, okay, I'm a CEO, I'm listening. I was just offended by the last question that Quinn asked. Uh, and now you give me this answer that, uh it creates this meaning it has um do you have any reason to believe that purpose going to all this work we're talking about coming up this purpose actually makes a difference in an organization you said at the individual level we have research that demonstrates that people's lives change um why should we believe that having a purpose will make a difference in my organization what difference would it make Okay, so Bob, that's a great question. Let me clarify. First of all, the word purpose has been hijacked, right? It's been hijacked by a, by a debate happening above the topic we are discussing. It's hijacked by the people who are studying the future of capitalism. The debate between democracy and capitalism and all that is going on above us. And there what has happened is on one side, people say the purpose of business should be shareholder value, one answer, right? And the other answer is anything but shareholder value. Purpose is about, you know, social projects and is synonymous with social purpose. So purpose is anything but profit. And I think that's where this, these, that debate has caused so much confusion at the organization. level. So a CEO says, having a purpose is labeling myself, right? Oh, this is another work enterprise. And, and I think what we don't understand is purpose has four benefits that I want to just highlight for you. The first benefit of purpose is purpose is a directional system. It creates an orienting schema, right? A pathway for attention, you know, as uh, my colleague, uh, Willie Ocasio would call it, kind of really focusing your attention on a certain set of activities. So purpose is a way to focus our attention on what is important, what's not important. Helping us think about prioritizing. It's not win-win, but it's helping us make those trade-offs that we need to make. So that's the first piece of purpose. Then there are three other benefits of purpose that I was able to map out. The first is purpose is motivational. Turns out that a generation of, there's a cohort of employees who care about companies that are doing something with meaning attached to it. That elicits what we call inspired work, what Jane Dutton and Amy Rosinski have talked about as well. That when I feel connected to the larger agenda of my enterprise, of having a larger impact in some way, I am inspired at work and that means I am much more productive. So there, and, and I will stay longer. So we have lots of research showing, especially after COVID, we are looking for meaning in what we do in our life. And work is a part of life. So there's a motivational benefit. The next benefit I discovered was reputational. Customers seem to care. Not about do goody things, but I want to know who you are and what you stand for. And so customers are much more. So there's a reputational benefit of purpose. And purpose branding has become an absolutely hot topic in marketing. You can talk to Richard Edelman and others who are studying trust in business. Purpose is an important pillar into this story. And the last one, which was the least obvious one to me, Bob, was uh, 
I found that companies with a strongly stated purpose had an easier time forming partnerships and collaborative agreements with others. In the world of ecosystems and platforms, partnerships are key, but somehow having a clear purpose not only created an affinity for others like you to want to partner with you, but it creates this signal of trustworthiness. And so I found companies, so you have four benefits, directional, motivational, reputational, and relational. So for me, that was the journey also to understand how companies put their purpose to work. Um, I could go through the work of coming up with a deep purpose, a real purpose, put it on my website, but you suggested a couple places in the book that the purpose has to be the arbiter of every decision. That is, I could have a great purpose, but if I believe it's just words and it doesn't affect the day-to-day -day decisions, then I really don't have a purpose. Um, but yet many people cannot conceive of a purpose driving every decision in a company. Could you, could you help us understand what in the world this is about? Let me pick an example here, Bob. I'm going to talk about uh, Bueller, uh, a company a lot of you may not have heard of, but just to clarify, Bueller is a privately held company in, the, in Switzerland, and uh, they make machines that process food. 65% uh, of the world's grain harvests are processed on their machines, 30% of rice harvests, 75% of the world's malt supplies and about a third of the global breakfast cereals. So big central player, but really under the radar. And, you know, at one level, you can read their mission statement on the website. It says innovations for a better world. And you're going to say, I don't get it. Right. But if you look at their R&D efforts, I talked to the head of R&D uh, and Ian told me that Ian said, look, you know, when we are doing our resource allocation around projects, we're thinking about this question. This is what informs our thinking. They have a venture fund. They used to invest in small ventures who are on the cutting edge of food tech. How do they decide? They say, are they, is there affinity between their purpose and our purpose? I talked to the head of HR. And her take was also, she says, you know, as we're looking at talent, as we're looking at promoting talent, as we're looking at hiring talent, we started to talk about our purpose. And by the way, they were never in the top 10 most desirable places to work in Switzerland. And since they kind of articulated and really sharpened their purpose, they've been in the top five every year and nothing else has changed. So clarifying their purpose, using it as a filter. Now, I may have overstated if I say all decisions are taken through the filter of purpose, they're not. I also want to clarify that that's why some companies take their purpose statement, if you will, and have another layer over there of what they call guiding principles. So, you know, just to translate their purpose into actionable rules, what Kathy Eisenhart, our colleague at Stanford, would call simple rules, that organizations need simple rules to arbitrary decisions. Um, there's another piece of this, which I want to just clarify to you, is that people have used this a lot, that purpose is win-win. That purpose takes you to the land of the magical land of win-win. Uh, what some have called shared value even. I, I'm a, I, I think it's a hugely important set of ideas, but I think I found that, you know, um, most of business decisions is more trade-offs, hard choices. How much are we going to, inflation right now, 8% inflation, how much are we going to raise prices? Oh, we have wages, employees want to get paid more. How much are we going to pay them more? Right? Oh, you know, we have a huge effort to do, you know, rehabilitation of our communities and, and helping refugees from Ukraine and whatever else we have going on. How much are we going to allocate that? So this idea that I can keep growing the pie endlessly and there are no trade-offs, I think is a, is a myth. Most of businesses, hard trade-offs and choices. And how do I decide how much? And purpose doesn't give you the answer, but it gives you at least an orienting framework so you can think about the choices. And when you make those choices, you have something to look back to and say, I'm sorry, I do, because people are going to be upset. All trade-offs involve making people upset. 
when you uh, wrote about trade-offs, you shared, I thought, a pretty powerful story of a company that was pursuing the purpose in earnest, and yet they faced some problems where they had to engage in practices that um, were contrary to the purpose. And that was this big trade off they were caught up in. And you said, look, this happens all the time. And then you offered some very wise advice about how to deal with that. What, what, what do you have to tell us about that? So I think the example you think, maybe I, I think so, is the is example of Gotham Green. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Gotham Green is an agrotech company that is doing urban farming on urban rooftops. And, and their idea is it's almost water zero. So, you know, they recycle 96% of their water gets used again. Um, they're using empty spaces. Uh, they're doing it in uh, activities that have high spoilage, which is salads and herbs. Um, and, and by sh- reducing transportation costs, not only do you reduce spoilage, but you also reduce transportation costs. So your carbon footprint is drastically reduced. Now they're doing all these things and they're selling their herbs and making a decent profit. Big problem, packaging, plastic. So they're agonizing over this. So they go and talk to their retail partners and they say, can we do without packaging? They say, no, no, no. A, it doesn't, it spoils much faster and customers want it packaged. So then they looked at a whole range of options, but turns out nothing keeps uh, these things fresh as long as plastic, good old fashioned plastic. And so after much agonizing, they had they came to the realization they had to stay with plastic, which they did. Now, is that perfect? Of course not. You might say, oh, contradiction. I can't believe you hypocrites. And But they, the deliberate intent and thoughtfulness with which they went about it, and then the realization that they were, had to make this trade-off, and the commitment that they were going to keep looking for new solutions as and when they became available. So I think I wanted to just showcase that, that, you know, we live in the, I call it the razor's edge. It's not mine. It's from a great book by Somerset Mom. And in which he talks about that, you know, life is about walking on the razor's edge where we're making hard choices. And the question is, do we have an orienting framework to help us navigate those choices? And then do we have that framework to communicate those choices also? Um, I love the image of the razor's edge, and I love how in your previous answers, you started talking about certain tensions. You know, we do have to make a profit, right? And yet we can be a purpose to run. You know, normally those are conflicting notions. Um, When we're all trained formally and informally in economic assumptions when we enter the world of business, and... I would suggest that economics tends to be amoral in the end, but you talk about in this book, um, the soul of the company. You talk about the moral system and, uh, you know, these are not economic notions and they could make me quite uncomfortable. So, you know, my question is, you know, what is the soul of the company? What is the moral system uh, that doesn't sound like something I've. Um, and how in the world do they interface with my need to make a profit every day? So here, uh, Bob, I am a huge beneficiary of work you have done with Anjan Takor. And, and that was really a very, very eye-opening framing for me in the book and the HBR article that you both wrote. Um, You know, in economics, we have a very reductionist view of organizations, and we call it a nexus of contracts, that everyone is connected through a nexus of contracts. Now, what your work helped me remember was actually work that goes back a while. Chester Barnard, who was in 1930s, a professor at Harvard Business School, talked about, it was called the function of the executive. And it was all about creating a community organization. He said, what a community where people are bound together by a commitment, not by a contract. It wasn't just trying to, uh, uh, just a transaction. It was more than a transaction. There was a connection. In the 50s, there was another scholar named Philip Selznick who wrote about how uh, some organizations, not all, get infused with meaning in which people then are bonded and connected to the organization. 
But this goes back actually to work in the early last century by an, a French sociologist, Emile Durkheim, who was writing about religious communities. But the idea he was saying was that human beings can create connective uh, organizations where people are bonded around a set of ideals. We come together because we believe in something. We have a shared ideal of wanting to do something that creates meaning for us. And, and you know, it's interesting. Um, I'll go back to, um, you know, there's so many organizations. One of the organizations was Etsy, the online retailer. And, and, and the CEO there, you know, described to me how he, uh, Josh Silverman described to me how he wanted to be an organization where people found meaning in what they do on an everyday basis. That what we do should matter. That we are not here just in an economic exchange with each other. Yes, we want to get paid. Yes, we want to get paid for performance. Yes, we want autonomy and we want to have discretion. Yes, we want to learn and grow and be challenged and be stimulated. And But we want more than that. And it tied to actually a piece I read in the, 19, in the 2015 where they talked about the idea that you know, organizations were designed for satisfaction at one point. That gave jobs at. Then we wanted to have engaged workers. Now we want inspired workers. And to tap into that inspiration, you have to get people energized around something bigger. Yes, you want the sat. Yes, you want the engaged. We want to get paid well. We want to get paid for more. We want all those things. And you can't have just meaning and nothing else. But how do we create that larger sense of meaning? Uh, I'll give you an example from sports. So in, in my investigations here, Bob, I said, I'm going to look outside of business as well. So I interviewed and did a case actually on the Seattle Seahawks coach, Pete Carroll. Okay, they didn't have the best of seasons this year. Uh, but I wanted to share with you very interesting how he has articulated a purpose for the Seahawks, but also try to get people to talk about their own personal purpose and connect it into the organization's purpose. And here's, I want to read you a quote from what Pete said to me. He said, there's magic when organizations can inspire people to align their own personal passion, self-understanding, and desire for growth with a common organizational ambition. And, and the team mantra is, I'm in. So it's an invitation. Now, I want to juxtapose that with the New England Patriots team mantra, which is, do your job. <laughs> now, both are winning teams, by the way. I want to tell you, both have had a great run. But you see, it, organizations are self-fulfilling in some ways a nexus of contracts versus what you called a nexus of commitments. And I think is that's what the language, and that's when I suddenly read that. And you see this in startups a lot. It's fascinating. Howard Schultz has come back three times to Starbucks and every time he says, Starbucks has lost its soul. Now there's more to that story than just that simple statement. But, you know, how do we create a context where people find meaning in what they're doing there. It work is personal. You uh, use some words that I think linked to this that I found very striking. You said uh, purpose has the potential to galvanize people and then produce outsized performance. I was very taken by that because my experience is when we find a, perp a company that truly is committed to higher purpose, we see exponential improvements, not incremental improvements. And I think that links. So help us understand outsized performance and why, why would that happen? Why would purpose do that? So look, I can, let me start with some data, first of all. There was a study done by some uh, uh, two authors, Garten and Mankin in uh, HBR in 2015. And they actually measured kind of productivity improvements, productive output of workers from dissatisfied, that was a baseline of 71, 
Satisfied was the baseline was 100%. Engaged was 144. So you got 44% bump if people were engaged or were satisfied. And inspired was 225. And so the unlock is in many ways now, you might say it's just productive output, but I absolutely, it's, it's not just quantity, it's quality. And you see this most vividly in, I told you, small companies. Um, you know, with a former student of mine, we did a study on the scaling of small ventures. And there are people who are what they call early joiners. They don't start businesses, they're joiners. They join small companies, they hang around till it's about 500 odd people or a thousand, and then they leave and go on to the next one. They are small company junkies. And you might say they're generalists, they're jack of all trade, but they love the energy of all hands on deck. They love being part of that community. And something that gets lost as an enterprise scales. And that kind of clarity of intention, camaraderie, connection around a common set of ideals. Now, not every startup has ideals, I should clarify to you. But I think it's important to, maybe we can learn from that. So many large companies want to be like small companies. We want to be entrepreneurial. Well, you want to be entrepreneurial. Let's start to unpack what entrepreneurial means. It means, of course, sense of ownership. It means sense of customer connection. It also means sense of purpose. It doesn't mean save the planet. It means we want to have an impact. We want to change our business model. We want to change the way this community. I mean, think about the, the purpose at you know, PayPal or, or Airbnb. Um, these come or Netflix, even. You know, they began not saying let's go make a boatload of money. They began by saying, we believe there is an opportunity here to really reduce friction. So I'll give you an example. I, I recently interviewed two CEOs. Uh, one is Mona Ataya, CEO of Mums World, the largest uh, e-commerce site for women and mothers in the Middle East. And, and it began, you might say, the simple e-commerce that mothers need diapers and toys and Middle East didn't they want any opportunities. But then she said it was really about, became much more than that. We're going to unlock opportunity for women in the Middle East. We're going to give them tools. We're going to give them ways to kind of uplift themselves. Uh, they employed mostly women. They had a funding round for their startup where they only allowed women investors to invest. They said, we want women to join the upsides of business. So it wasn't just about like, let's have an e-commerce company here. It was much more expansive than that. Or I interviewed also uh, Mudassar Shekha, the co-founder of Kareem. Uh, the largest rideshare company in the Middle East that began, I don't know, more than a decade ago, now is owned by Uber. And Kareem and his partner started it after his partner, they were both at McKinsey, and his partner had this life-threatening brain disease. And he wasn't sure he was going to make it. And, I, and, and when he went into surgery, he said, I'm going to do something of impact when I come out. So he and Mudassar said, what are we going to do? And they discovered that in the Middle East, there were many places where women didn't have a driver and they were not able to move around. They said, can we create a ride share company in which we create well-trained drivers that families are comfortable allowing their women to go in that car? So we're gonna empower women by giving them the opportunity to go around. And then they also found that drivers are exploited by taxi companies. So they said, we're not gonna call them drivers, we're gonna call them pilots, and we're not gonna have exploitative arrangements with them either. And this thing went on to become a unicorn in a couple of years. So you see this kind of expansive notion of self that brings together, and you see who comes and works there, who chooses to work in these enterprises. Both of them talked about that it was the true believers because there was no startup culture and huge upside and payouts for unicorns in the middle. It was really the people who believed in the mission. So you I love, love it. I just love it. Um, you know, going back to the start of your answer, uh, the people that were inspired, the number's 225. That's outsized, right? That's exponential. That is radically different. This summer, I met a CEO who was a very purpose-driven CEO, and he uttered a sentence that took my breath away. He said, I tell my people, I do not want you to hold them accountable. I want them to hold themselves accountable. 
Now, that's a stunning sentence. And I began to share that in a number of executive sessions with various groups. And some people really liked it. Others appeared terrified by it. <laughs> that is, no one has ever taught me how to inspire anybody. You've taught me how to control people, how to use a compliance mindset, a hierarchy mindset. I have no idea how to inspire people. And you're saying, you know, this, uh, you know, we take this startup like this, uh, these are inspired people and get a unicorn. And, you know, it all sounds so wonderful. So I'm sitting here in the audience today. I'm drinking in all this wisdom of yours. And this kind of excites me. But what in the world do I do? How do I get started on this path? So, you know, um, uh, I have to confess, the bulk of my book is about the how do you do purpose. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, I would say, two thirds of the book. And of course, it starts with having a purpose, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you, if you're a startup, then you're crafting a purpose for yourself, right? That's kind of a statement about who am I? And, uh, and, and how do you even start to imagine what is the problem space you want to operate in? But if you're an established company, uh, one of the companies I looked at was Lego. And the CEO of Lego at the time, Jorn Vignustrup said to me, he made a very powerful statement. Uh, and he said, you don't invent a purpose. You don't decide a purpose. You detect or discover it. So he had to go into, and I, another company I looked at was Mahindra, where again, they, they had to hire somebody from outside to come in and interview insiders to distill the core essence of the enterprise. It was already there. So you have something that is both reflective. So, and, 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 and uh, in this chapter I have over there, I talk about engaging in what I call nostalgia with postalgia. You can't just look at the past. You got to look forward. And I give this imagery of the Sankofa bird is a Ghanaian bird folktale that flies forward with his neck looking backward. So how do you connect the past into the future? So that's kind of like capturing the essence of what is your purpose, really. Then how do you communicate your purpose? This is not some change management exercise and saying, okay, let's get it out there. And I discovered there what the late Jim March called leaders have to be poets and plumbers. You have, it's poetry and plumbing. And how do you get that out there? And for me to understand that, I looked at Indra Nui's uh, communications about performance with purpose at Pepsi. And it was kind of what one of the, the executives I interviewed at Pepsi said, it was complete surround sound performance, he said. And it was communicated in personal terms. So how do you then communicate your purpose? Then we get to embedding purpose. And, and Bob, this is where, I, I love what the CEO said, but I think we always have to have reinforcing systems as well, right? So mm -hmm. how do we think about our culture? Uh, and you know, one thing you have to understand is culture and purpose both provide a kind of a guiding framework. Mm -hmm. And you can't have freedom without a framework. Freedom without a framework creates chaos. So how do we create the culture and purpose working together in a supportive way to create that context within which people are going to operate and make decisions. And then I got to reward systems. How do you measure and reward purpose? This one really had me stumped. And I actually had finished the book and I had to given it to the publishers. Then I had to withdraw it and pull it back because I somehow met up with the CEO of EY. And EY, the CEO said, look, we're accountants. We got to measure everything. So when we came up with purpose, we had to build a measurement system. So there's a section in there that I added around, how do you measure? And they came up and said, we can't measure purpose directly. You can't say, well, how purpose are we? So he said, we're going to look at things that associate with purpose. So in their mind, their purpose, which is building a better working world, is associated with four dimensions of value. Financial value, social value, people value, and client value. And they said, we're going to have measures around all those four. And then we're going to make sure we have align them with our strategic pillars. So, you know, you start to see, so you need, I, I, I wrote a piece a few years ago called Structures That Don't Stifle Bob, in which I call freedom within a framework. You know, you can't have just plain freedom. Uh, and I think, you know, this raises the question on values. Uh, Ricky Geddes asked this question in the Q&A feed. 
And I think is that, you know, think about it. Values is another piece of the puzzle. So we're saying, here's our mission slash purpose. Here are some principles slash values. And around that is our strategy of what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. We need these guardrails within which we can then empower people. And I think is whether it's incentives and rewards, whether it's values, whether it's culture, whether it's purpose, all these create a context that allow us to loosen up the organization and give people that empowerment. As I listen to that word, loosen up the organization and give people the empowerment, it's interesting all the tensions that you've covered this morning, economic and moral, uh, control and inspiration, structure and pro the word and is seems to be so crucial. And it basically is saying this is not about single variable maximization. <laughs> All right, it's seeing a dynamic whole that's an organic system and bringing inspiration, galvanizing that system and getting tapping potential is just usually untapped. Now, we have questions and answers. Um, let's take and click on those and let's see if there's some you'd like to respond to. Um, you know. Let me go to one that was right or sitting at the top was about how do you detect, how do you say this is purpose and this is deep purpose? Do I have an algorithmic heuristic around how do you know that? And I, you know, I struggled with that myself, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I, all I can tell you is I can very, I can smell superficial purpose. Uh, purpose <laughs> that is just a disguise. Purpose is just not in some ways incorporated into the daily rhythm of the business. And so, the, and, and deep is not an either or condition. There's a continuum. To what extent are you using it? And so to me, purpose is not a purpose statement. It's the extent to which it is being utilized in the daily operating rhythm of the business. To what extent are you really putting it to work for you? Is purpose really driving that? And I think is, I want to just tell you one thing is this came to me uh, a while ago was that uh, Thomas Toon Anderson, the chairman of Orsted, the largest alternative energy company in, in Europe, said to me, I pity those who think of purpose coming at the expense of performance. He said they somehow, but there's the other extreme too, people who hide behind purpose and saying, I'm not making money because we have a purpose, which happens to be social, by the way. That happened at Danone, right? That, you know, where CEOs start to say, well, I'm not able to deliver results you know, but I am delivering purpose. And, you know, the late Peter Drucker once said, profit for a company is like oxygen for a person. If you don't have enough of it, you're out of the game. But if you think oh, your life is about breathing, you're really missing something. And so part of this, the confusion comes because people think of purpose means profit plus something else. And it's that something else that is a tax on business. And I think we have to understand it's not a tax on business it actually enables the business. Now, the one thing, Bob, we haven't talked about is that this purpose, why are investors talking about purpose? Why is Larry Fink, who wrote the foreword to my book, talking about purpose in his letters? And I was puzzled myself. So I came to realize that investors are in the risk business, right? They make money on risk, but they want to de-risk as much as they can. And in their minds, you know, when a business is able to articulate a long-term vision for themselves, that allows them to have a little bit less risk there because they understand they have thought about their business in the future scenario. And purpose is a forcing mechanism to think long-term. But And the moment you think long-term, any business has to think about different stakeholders. And so multi-stakeholder orientation is a byproduct of having a purpose that forces you to think long-term. We've got the logic all messed up. And I think is so purpose is a way, a pathway into uh, imagining a business that enables us to think about the stakeholders we got to serve. You know, I love what you just said. And it goes back to that comment I made just a minute ago. Um, we have an imagination. We have a logical mind. Uh, when we are solving problems all day long, as executives do, we tend to focus very narrowly and we step away from that imagination. What you just described, again, goes back to seeing a dynamic whole 
with the past, the present, and the future. That's technical in nature. It's human in nature. I'm seeing that dynamic whole and purpose is taking me to a place that, well, uh, one person, very prominent person said, the highest purpose of a leader is to continually clarify the purpose. That's what turns silos into a gal galvanized system. And yet this is hard work. Is there another question you want to hit that's on there? Yeah, um, I think there's some great questions here and I'll do my best to get through quickly. First of all, Kanika, your question about purpose and culture. I told you already, purpose and culture work in consonance. And if you really want to see how that plays out in real life, I would urge you to read Satya Nadella's book about the turnaround transformation of Microsoft because those are the two things he went after. Culture was a growth mindset and then they had a purpose they articulated and these two together were foundations to building a strategy and implementing it. Um, you can also, you're welcome to go read my uh, case on Netflix and one on Bueller that I have, which also touch on this. Um, you know, the, Tammy asked a question that, have you observed company purpose as contributing to individual purpose, motivation and engagement? Is there room for individuals to propose purpose their personal? I think I want to just clarify one thing to you on this one is that, you know, th there's a phrase we use a lot, work-life balance. You know, it's a horrible phrase. It's horrible because it, it puts work and life in opposition to each other. I get work leisure balance, work family balance. Work is part of life. And I think COVID, I just wrote a, a piece this last year called The Great Rethink. I said, it's not the great resignation. It's really a great rethink. COVID has forced us to really reevaluate our own space in the world. We've confronted death, illness, you know, in a, a isolation in a very short span of time. And I think it's about understanding our own place in the world. And organizations, businesses are struggling to get people back to work. Come on, get engaged again. You know, this and the other. Getting people back. We have a labor shortage. I think we're, we've forgotten that people today expect more out of work. And by the way, younger generations even more. So how can we wake, infuse work with meaning? How do we have, you know, I love the work by Jane Dutton and Amy Rosnitsky on job crafting. How can we make sure that's not something that's happening spontaneously, but is done deliberately? Um, and I think it's- uh, Ranjay, I think we're just about out of time. What I am reflecting on as I come to the end of this is I'm looking at a man who is full of passion. And it takes me back to that opening question. We are so grateful for your fine mind and your deep passion. You clearly are a man of purpose. And you've really, really helped so many of us today. So thank you. Uh, for our participants, I want everyone to know that uh, this week, the center will be mailing out the uh, link to the video uh, and any other resources that Ron, Ron Jay shares with us. So that'll be coming. Um, our next session on positive links features uh, Christine Porath from Georgetown University. She'll be talking about her new book, Mastering Community, The Surprising Ways Coming Together Moves Us from Surviving to Thriving. Uh, that'll take place uh, virtually on Tuesday, February 7th from 2 to 3 Eastern Time. And we hope you all come back and join us again. And I would just conclude by saying once again, Ranji, you are a treasure to us. And we deeply, deeply appreciate what you've shared with us. Thanks so very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me here. It was really a pleasure and honor today to be here.